You know, you wouldn't walk up to a heavy person and say, how much do you weigh? Well, you wouldn't, would you? Would you? You wouldn't walk up to an ugly person <laughs> and say, how ugly are you, right? You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't walk up to a person with a bad complexion and say, how many zits did you wake up with this morning? You just, you wouldn't do that. But people don't hesitate to walk up to me and say, how tall are you? So I'm 5'20". I don't have to ask. People like to say cute things to me, things they assume I've never heard before, like, uh, how's the weather up there, right? You know, so I usually spit on them, tell them it's raining, and uh, <clears throat> I usually deals with it. Now, this meeting is kind of a get acquainted meeting. This is not your typical traditional fair. If, if you're looking for, if you're new here, uh, if you're just checking the place out, uh, at least give it another try because this is not what you're usually going to get. We're, we're, we're getting acquainted to see if you want to spend the, the next three nights with me. And, uh, and what we're going to be doing is, is going to be kind of fun. You see, sin happens in three categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. Boastful pride of life is just who you're mad at, toward whom do you have a grudge. Yeah. Do you have a root of bitterness? And, and I guess I'd ask the question, have you ever gone to bed thinking about what you'd like to have happen to someone? Huh? Am I the only guy who's ever thought about that? Well, that person did that to you back when, but they still own you if you're still thinking those thoughts about them. And so we're going to deal with all that on, on, uh, on Sunday night in a message called, Have Your Nostrils Flared Lately. Old Testament talk for when's the last time you got real mad. Now, if anger's never been a problem for you, you don't have to show up. But, but, but if you have had a problem with anger, per, perhaps you'd like to. Then, then on Monday night's big night. That's, uh, that's sex night here at Irvine. And uh, uh, that's where we're going to uh, let those of you who have been pure know how much that means. And those of you who messed up along the way, how many times have you confessed that sin? I mean, just think about it. Fifty? Hundred? How many times did you need to? One? Whose voice are you listening to? Well, we're we're going to put that. We're, we're going to put that all away in a message called "Sometimes It's Sin, Sometimes It's Not." Nor will I burn if I get the hots. And uh, and uh, <laughs> you want to come early? That'll be a fairly full house. Uh, <laughs> on Monday, so that's a pride of life and less of the flesh, and then on. Uh, on the last night, we're going we're gonna to deal with values and lust of the eyes and then apply it all to an issue of lordship and you're going to get a look through the eyes of a blind beggar that I don't think you'll ever forget. So, so that's the ground we're going to cover. One principle you'll need to know is uh, eclairs in your refrigerator. You're walking along and you go by the bakery and there are two chocolate eclairs in there. <laughs> You like chocolate eclair. You're on a diet, but you don't snag too. And you put them in a sack and you take them home and you put them in the refrigerator and you go in your living room rug and you kneel down and you pray. Oh God, help me not to eat those chocolate eclairs. <laughs> How much power in that prayer? Well, let's analyze it. Does God look at our heart or our words? Heart. If your heart doesn't match your words, you are double-minded. And if you're double-minded, you've grieved or quenched the power of prayer. You with me? All right, so let's analyze your heart. Why'd you put the eclairs in the refrigerator? So the key. I tell you, you can justify their consumption. So based upon where you put them, have you or have you not already decided to eat them? Yes. So did you have a prayer? It's like a young person going out on a date. Let's just park and we'll just talk. Give me a break. It's an eclair in your refrigerator. <laughs> See how it works. All right, so if you'd like to deal with your anger and if you'd like to get that immoral past put behind you and if you'd like to rearrange your priorities and if you'd like to be legitimately confronted with lordship where you've been filled with the spirit for perhaps the first time in years, Next three nights, your nights. So we'll start uh, seven each night. 
and we'll finish promptly at uh, 8.30, and uh, I think you'll have a grand time. Well, let's see if you want to spend those three nights with me. Uh, let's get acquainted. We'll pick up my story when I was 6'3". Uh, now, when I was 6'3", I was uh, 14. <laughs> and when I was 14, I weighed a little less than 130 pounds. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. I had microphones, Stan and I had a lot in common in those days. <laughs> when I put on my striped swimsuit, there's just one stripe on it, you know? <laughs> I had to run around the shower to get wet. I had to be careful to drain. I could tread water in a test tube. All those things are true of me. I was afraid of girls, too. I mean, that size, girls are really scary. But at 14, something interesting starts to happen. I was combing my hair one day, and... Uh, hair. It was growing out from under my arm. My voice had been cracking for two or three weeks, and when that happens to a guy, he starts to notice <laughs> the ladies. <laughs> and there was this one at school. <laughs> she was 5'10", <laughs> weighed a little less than 110 pounds. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I think if her knees had bent the other direction, she would have passed as a flamingo, you know, and I, I thought she was gorgeous. I was afraid to talk to her, though, because girls were so scary. I was walking down the halls of my school one day, and I noticed up ahead of me, she's walking toward me. <laughs> we're going to pass each other in the hall. <laughs> well, I've never been that close to her before, you know. I back when Sing Song Sing, I got goosebumps on my arms, and as we got close, she said, hi. <laughs> I said, oh, hi, <laughs> kept walking, and uh, that's the end of the story. Now, uh, <laughs> it was two or three weeks later, I was catching a ride. Now, this is back in the 50s. I'm pretty old and pretty wrinkled, and in the 50s, you could catch a ride and be relatively safe. And my daddy's from the high desert in Southern California, the Mojave Desert, a place called China Lake, Ridgecrest. Anybody know where that is? They shoot rockets off, develop Sidewinder missile out there. It's 90 miles from Death Valley. It's not exactly hell, but you can see it from there. You know, one of those kind of places. And my daddy was the bookie in town. He, he took book on, uh, made book on, on, on horses. That's, that's against the law, and uh, that's what he did. And he ran the card games at the back of the porthole bar and cafe. I'm a little bar kid. I'd clean the cards and check the dice and... I know about that stuff. Some alcoholism in my household. Uh, my mom, schedule alcoholic, uh, did a fifth and a half of vodka a day. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little torqued. Dysfunctional's highly overused. Uh, <laughs> torqued, I, I think, is a, a little better word. But you can have godly character and be torqued. You can. That's my background. I, I didn't do church. You can understand. Bookie's kid in church. Just didn't work, <laughs> you, you know. So I'm catching a ride on Friday night, and the guy picks me up. Of course, a six, seven-minute car ride, he asked me to go to church. I didn't want to go, but I'm going to okay. I'm sitting seven rows back, eight, maybe right over in there. And the guy who's preaching is one of those classic pure fire and brimstone kind of preachers. Have you ever heard pure fire and brimstone? You're not the type. I mean, I'm talking... Turn or burn, you know, flip or fry, you know, change your stroke or go down in smoke. I mean, when this guy preached, he'd, he'd blow your hair back, you know. Whoa, he'd take your breath, suck you forward, and he'd blow you back with another salvo. And I loved the way he said, God, he said, God, and the room would shake and his jowls would vibrate and spit and fly all over the front row. Yeah. I'd never heard anything like that. He quotes the scriptures, only he can quote it. I'll do it the way he did it, then I'll translate for you. And what he said was, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Now I'm thinking, see, I'm your basic good kid. I, I didn't do things wrong. It wasn't because I wanted to get caught, quite frankly, uh, uh, be good. I, I was quite frankly, I was terrified of getting caught. You understand. But either motive will produce a good kid. Uh, and I said, yeah, I suppose I've sinned, but I mean, compared, compared to my buddies at school. I mean, if this guy wants to meet some people in the sin, I'll introduce him to my friends. Because they actually do the kind of things I just think about. <laughs> they didn't get that one. No, uh, do you think they did? No, all right. Then he quotes another scripture. Wages of sin is what? Death. Let's understand what that means there. It's called hell. Wages of sin is hell. I've written a book called Playing with Fire. Do nice people really go to hell? Most of us don't believe nice people go there. We try to somehow deal with that mentally because how can a loving God let such a place exist? So we somehow go through the, the, the gymnastics of helping ourselves to not cope with some kind of concept like that. But I, you know, I don't love like God loves. Do you? Like, you know, you're very nice. We shook hands. I met you. But I, I love my wife more than I love you. Y you know, I, well, I do. I, you know, and, and, and you. Uh, you love her more than you love my wife, don't you? <laughs> you better. Yeah, all right. So, and, and you know, I, I think your kids are great, you know, but I, I like, you know, it's like, see, I think you're terrific, but I like my son better than you. I do, you know, and I'm sure you're very nice, but see, I, I just don't love like God loves. He, he loves us completely and, and all the same, perfectly. And if you can't understand perfect love, there is no way you can understand the concept or the need for perfect justice. I do not understand it. I wish the place didn't exist, but folks, my wishing doesn't distort the word of God. Is it an absolute place that exists? And Jesus spoke about it situationally a third more than he spoke about love. You can't follow Christ and not come to grips with the odds on there being a place like that. And the wages of sin is hell. Well, I didn't like that. Now... How many times does it take to say no to God to be separated from him? How, how many times? There's a hint. What? One. One. Okay. Now, have you said no to God at least once in your lifetime? Yes or no? Heard somebody say no? You just sin. Ha! All right, so you see how that works. See, you're an onion. You stink. Sin makes you stink. Onions stink. You stink. This is the nature of an onion to stink. Now, if you think you don't stink, sniff the person on your right. I'm serious. Sniff him. You sniff her. Sniff her. You sniff over there. You're sitting there. You're rebellious onions, and you're not doing what you're told, and the camera's on you. Now sniff somebody. Now sniff the one on your left. Let me tell you what you smell. You either smell their stink, or you smell something covering up their stink. Am I right on this deal or not? <laughs> see, see, you don't have to be embarrassed about stinking. It is the nature of an onion to stink. Onions just stink. It's what they do. Now, some of you do stink more than others. We found that out. Some of you are Bermuda onions. You take a slab of Bermuda onion, you put it on a burger, pound it down just before bedtime, it will give you the kind of morning mouth that only your dog really appreciates, you know? <laughs> but some of you are walla walla sweets. How many of you have ever had a walla walla sweet onion? I see the hands, yeah. Actually, it's only a walla onion. It's just half the town it used to be. But you've got the whole gamut of onion them. Red onions, green onions, leeks, chives. Bermudas are the worst. Walla Wallas, Mauis, you know, they vie for the best. But the one thing that every, every onion has in common with every other onion is that it stinks. Now you're beginning to understand why you as an onion can't go to heaven. 
Well, there's no stink in heaven. God is perfect, holy, and pure. There is no stink in his refrigerator. You put an onion in a refrigerator, what's it do to everything in the refrigerator? Makes it stink. Don't you understand? If you as an onion went to heaven, you'd stink up by heaven. Don't, don't you understand? So, so what do you do to an onion to, to fix it? Well, you can cook it. Cooking the onion will get rid of some of the stink. Now, let me prove that to you. I'd like you right now to sniff an old person. <laughs> yeah, just find an old person and sniff them. Uh, don't be embarrassed. They know if they're old or not. It is not that big a deal. Just find an old person and sniff an old person right now. Okay, did you do that? Good. Now, let me tell you what you didn't smell. Old people don't stink like young people. Life has cooked the stink out of them, brother. You, you know what I mean? Life is not easy. I saw a bumper sticker. It said, life's hard, and then you die. Have a nice day. You know what I said? Whoa, that's right. Life is really hard. But you take a cooked onion, put it in a refrigerator. What's to do to everything in the refrigerator? Makes it stink. Eh? Cooking an onion helps the problem, but it doesn't solve the problem. See, to be in God's refrigerator, it can't stink at all. And what's the basic nature of an onion to stink? And when you're born an onion to begin with, it wasn't the first time you said no to God. You were born an onion. What do you do? Well, you can take an onion and you can, <laughs> you can wrap it in saran wrap. Cling wrap. Handy wrap. Ziploc that sucker. You can do that. Put it in there. It won't stink. Now, <sighs> I could never grasp, and I'm not being blasphemous, and I'm not being irreverent. I just couldn't grasp the concept of what it meant to be covered by the blood of Christ. I couldn't get it. It seemed so gross to me. Grip. Grip. And then it hit me. Saran wrap. God just covers you with his blood, presents you to the Father, and he goes... Smells like my son. That's a pretty good illustration of what Old Testament sacrifices did for us. They paid the interest on the principle, but they never touched the principle. And then Christ died on the cross. He took the onion. What's at the center of an onion? Nothing. It doesn't have a core. At the center of the onion, Jesus Christ planted a seed. Apple, banana, orange, <laughs> kiwi, right? And, and, and as the fruit grows... So you're not an onion anymore. In Christ, you're that piece of fruit that is growing, conforming in his image as you are discipled. And the thickness of the onion layer, that's on the outside getting thinner and thinner as the fruit grows. That's the sin nature. That's that old flesh. But the whole thing is sealed with the blood of Christ. That's not bad. That's who you are. He paid off the principle, not just the interest. Give me the worst person to ever live, excluding biblical characters. Who should we go with? Hitler. It's usually Hitler. Saddam gave him a little run for his money. He just didn't have enough time. <laughs> so make Hitler your left hand. Comfortably set it right here. Left hand right here. Comfortably. Don't sit in the front row and fold your arms and try to stare me down. Put your hand right here. <laughs> I'm out of here in the middle of the week. It doesn't matter if I make you mad. It doesn't matter. All right. Now the best person that ever lived, excluding biblical characters. Who should we go with? Mother Teresa? Okay, we'll go with Mother Teresa. That, now you have, you have somebody else, you have somebody else. Mother Teresa would never say, yes, you're right, I am the best person to ever live. You know, she said she wouldn't be. So, so, so she's got somebody else, Billy Graham or somebody. So, so you work with whatever names you want, but we're going to work with Hitler is the worst. Mother Teresa is the best. Got your hands right here? Go over your leg and put your hand up here where it belongs. All right, good. Don't be in the front row and try to think you can get away with it. Hitler's a one, Mother Teresa's a nine. Pick your number. I'm going to call on a few of you. Pick your number. Don't say I'm just a two. It's for dope pushers, hitmen, pimps, prostitutes, murders, people like that. So unless that's what you are, don't say I'm a two. 
Don't try to get spiritual and say I'm a nine or a 10. If that were true, your name would have come up. <laughs> All right, so pick your number. You, sir. What are you? Five. Been a little sin in your life along the way, I'm big fella. This guy's not an elder or anything, is he? Is he? Huh? Is it five? You don't want to five. Oh, what are you? Do you know this guy? Do you know him well? Pretty good. What what are you? A four. You're kidding. It's been years since I met a four. You think you're better than she is? <laughs> well, you said you're a five. She says a four. Obviously, you must think you're better than she is. What do you say? You want to change your number? <laughs> you, sir, what are you? A five. And you, what are you? Oh, that's safe. It is so boring. How many sixes do we have in the room? Six or better? Raise your hand. Pick your numbers. Where are you? You all do look better than this guy. I'll tell you, you do. Oh, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're comparing. Folks, what are we comparing? Onions to onions. It's the only way we can make ourselves feel good. And it's how you end up with the concept that nice people don't really go to hell. Haven't you heard somebody say that? Well, if nice people go to hell, there'll be a whole lot of people in hell before I get there. And I say, you are absolutely right. There will be a lot of people in hell before you get there. Because <laughs> nice doesn't have anything to do with it. You're an onion. You see, we determine who's nice. We like to think who's going to heaven on the basis of how you determine a good hitter in baseball. If you get on base every time, what do you call it? Lucky. Yeah. Well, what else do you call it? Batting a thousand. Why doesn't anybody aspire to bat a thousand? It's impossible. So the way we feel good about ourselves is see who hit what, and then those who hit at the top, they're the ones who are called the good hitters. And we say they must be okay because they're good, and the rest of us aren't as good as them, so we don't know if we're okay. So if you're good, you're bound to be all right. It's not biblical, folks. Doesn't have a thing to do with it. We're all onions. Let's go to the Grand Canyon. We're going to jump it. Six miles across, God's on the other side, he's a 10. Only 10s go to heaven. Mother Teresa's the best long jumper to ever live. <laughs> Pulls up her habit and motors towards the edge and she soars 40 feet across the canyon. 40 feet, you know how far that is? That, that's 10 feet further than they went in the Olympics. If somebody broke a record by 10 feet, it would hit the papers and be a big, Deal, and where'd she go? Colorado River. Now, Hitler, old blob body, never could jump in six feet, two bounces, and where'd he end up? Colorado River, and where are you gonna end up? You try to jump that canyon on your own. River. Fourth person on the canyon, it's Christ. Got one of those kids' fanny packs in it, you know? Only this one's adjusted to fit the size of Yours. Got your name on it. You know, if you're too proud to ask for a ride, you won't get to go. If you don't believe he can make the jump with you in the pack, you won't ask him. And if you think you can get across any other way, you won't ask him. I've always wondered what repentance is. I could never grasp it because if it's works, if repentance is some kind of works, if it's something I do, then Christ wouldn't have to die for my sin. But what is it? I think it's agreeing that I don't have the capacity within me to stand before a holy God and be okay. 
because he's perfect, I am certainly not that. And unless I am, I can't stand in front of him unless Christ is standing there with me. I'm sitting in that meeting, and the guy, he finds me. I don't know how he found me. I think he had the kind of eyes that are in the painting in the haunted house at Disneyland, looks at everybody at the same time. How, how does it do that? How does it do that? But he locked onto me. And he screamed. Have you ever said no to God? And I said, yeah. It was a great day for me, folks. I thought I was a good guy. I thought that's all you had to be. And all of a sudden, I realized I was a sinner like everybody else. I needed Christ. As a 14-year-old, I asked Christ in my life. Next day, we had a youth retreat, one of those Saturday, Sunday jobbers, and I went, and guess who was on the retreat? <laughs> that little flamingo was on that trip. And we took his little walk down a gravel road late one night. I couldn't kiss her. No, no, I couldn't. I was terrified. I put my arm around her, though. I'd never done that before. It was so good. It was so good. It took me three weeks to kiss her, you know. I, I married her seven years later, though, and uh, her legs have filled out and her knees look great. She's a fox. All right. So, uh, well, let's see. I uh, got a scholarship to Oregon State University, played basketball, was all coast almost while I was there, achieved incredible notoriety, and then I uh, coached uh, a couple of years there, and then three years at UCLA. I was on John Wooden's staff. I was, uh, I was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's uh, personal coach. Now, I'm six foot eight. Some of you haven't figured out what 520 is yet. Yeah. Kareem's 7'2. I got a 37 inch arm. He's got a 42 inch arm. I have small hands for a man my size. His fingers are an inch and a half longer than mine. I'm not a good jumper. He's a great jumper. I'm the guy after whom they originally coined the phrase that there's nothing quicker than white hang time. <laughs> and, uh, Got a picture of Kareem, he's got baseline for reverse two-handed slam, both legs are up in the air like this. Understand I have to do them separately. <laughs> the net is sitting on its head, his head, he's trying to dunk the ball, but he can't dunk the ball because his head's in the way. He's doing a triple grimace while he's waiting for himself to start down. <laughs> Great picture on my wall. Then from there I played for the Lakers. Any Laker fans left? I see the hands. <laughs> Great, how many remember me? I see all the hands. <laughs> Bible says not to be proud or boastful. And you've given me no cause to sin, I'll tell you that for sure. Highlight of my career came in the Boston Garden against the then great Boston Celtics. I was in my usual seat. <laughs> it's a good one. There was never anyone sitting in front of me. <laughs> my contribution to the team, Gatorade was a brand new product in 1968. And I would take Gatorade and I would go, way to hustle. <laughs> nice rebound. Great shot, you know. I was usually bloated by halftime. <laughs> Go like this, you could hear me slosh. You know what that's kind of thing? I usually play during what we call garbage time. No matter how well you play, no matter how badly you play, you cannot possibly affect the outcome of the game. Sometimes I got to play then. This was the start of the second quarter, nationally televised game. Coach said, Cardi! I said, pass this down to the coach, you must be thirsty. <laughs> So now get your warm-ups off. I want you to play. <clears throat> I said, Coach, the game hadn't been decided yet. <clears throat> so get your stuff off. I whip out of my warm-up jacket. You don't have buttons and you don't have zippers. Things can get hung up. You have snaps. And you grab them and go, Pew! and you're out of them. And you have to have them on because the portable floor is over the ice. They don't melt the floor. They play hockey in the same places, so they just put the portable floor over the ice. So it's cool. So you have to have warm-ups. And snaps, you see, you have snaps all the way down the pant leg. So all I have to do is grab the waistband here and the waistband here, 
and those snaps come undone, and you're, you're out of them. See? So I come out of a warm-up jacket, I throw it on the floor, it starts to come out of my warm-up pants, and I, I had a, a thing flash through my mind. I have a friend, true story, played for the Detroit Pistons. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> On national TV, he comes out of his warm-up pants. <laughs> Only has on a smile. I am not <laughs> kidding you. We are talking full moon shot on national TV. Guy throws him a towel from the bench, wraps it around him, they all get up from the bench, get around him, and walk him into the dressing room of the camera. <laughs> and I said, I don't want that happening to me. I'm taking a peek. And I go, all right. I'm out of him, but it was scary for a minute. Now. You need to know, not only can I not jump, I'm very slow. Laker announcer Chick Hearn always said that when I ran, it looked like I was treading wood. <laughs> so the coach says, Cardi, what do you think we ought to do? I said, I don't know, you're the coach. He said, okay, you're gonna fast break. I said, you're out of your gourd. And he said, no, nobody would ever think of it. <laughs> no wonder you're the coach, only a genius would think of that. Here's the plan. So we get out on the floor, Wilt Chamberlain will be jumping center with Bill Russell. He's going to tap the ball over to Elgin Baylor. Jerry West is over here. As the ref throws the ball up, I'm going to take off running. John Havlicek's guarding me. He's really fast. He can run all day and never sweat. I mean, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Ladies, I'm sorry. It's a coarse word. Sweat. Horses sweat, men perspire, women glow. <laughs> yeah, all right, so anyhow, Havlicek won't expect me to go. That'll give me two or three step head start. Then when he turns and looks at me, he will never see anything working that hard, going that slow. I should get another two or three step head start. You give me four to six steps, that's quarter of a court. He's got a whole half court to go, so surely we can at least get to the hoop at the same time. And if we do, I'm three inches taller than he is, and I should be able to score. And I've never scored in Boston Gardens, never been on national TV. I'm pretty excited. I get out on the floor, and my leg's kind of going like this. Stop. Quick, stop, stop, stop. Ref throws the ball up. I take off running the wolf down to the back of his head. I get the ball. Everything's working perfectly. All I have to do is dribble three times, and I'm in. Won't be easy. I'm a forward. I'm not a guard. Guards are better ball handlers. I'm right-handed, but I'm going to have to dribble with my left hand. Won't be easy, but I figure I'll push it out there, run catch up to it, push it out there, run catch up. <laughs> should be able to do that three times. I should be able to. Havlicek realizes he's been had. He sounds like Fred Flintstone driving his car. He can hear his feet pity patting the hardwood. And I know he's close. I feel his breath on the back of my neck. <laughs> I get into the hoop and I plant my foot in order to transfer my momentum into a stationary object to allow my inertia to carry me skyward. I'm going to jump. <laughs> and Havlicek misjudges my speed. I'm going much slower than he thought. And, uh, <laughs> He just flashed on by, and I soared into the air about that high. <laughs> Laid the ball in the glass a little too far over the right, caught the inside lip of the cylinder, spun twice in the cone, looked like it might kick out, and I said, oh, no, don't miss a layup in Boston Garden. Please go in, please go in, please go in, please. It did. I was so, it was so good. I was one for one. I had two points, and I said to myself, <laughs> they went down shot, we got the rebound, came down offense. I set up left side, 20 feet. Somebody threw me the ball. So I said, let's consider the alternative. How many players on a team? First option is to pass. How many of my guys throw to? How many of their guys? Odds are bad, I decide not to throw it. Second option is to dribble. 
But I wear size 15 shoe, see? Some people, you gotta watch my eyes, some people in the front row do this. I wear size 15 shoe. Sometimes they do this. I wear size 15 shoe. <laughs> but this young lady was kind of casual as she did it. She did it like nobody I've ever seen. It was kind of a with a position shift and a double eye blink. This is kind of the way it happened. I wear size 15 shoe. My dad used to say my feet are the biggest things he ever saw that didn't have guts in them. <laughs> what would happen if a round ball hit on a regular surface? I don't know either. I don't dare dribble. Only eight seconds left on 24 second clock. What do they got to do? Preach. Preach. That's right. <laughs> Crank went off from 20. Now here's the key. You want to start with your upper arm parallel to the floor. You want your forearm at right angles your upper arm, and you want your wrist at parallel to your upper arm. See, you want to be carrying a pizza. You don't want to get in your palm. The pizza's hot. It'll burn your palm. So you want your finger, and if you carry it like this, it'll slide out on the floor and make a mess. So you got to have a little pizza. Very uncomfortable, but that's your shooting position. And you want to have your forearm in the elevator shaft. Because if it's out here, out of the shaft, you introduce a variable that's lateral. You don't want that. And you don't want it to go forward either because that makes the shot flat. Do you know two basketballs will fit through a basketball hoop at the same time? But not going this way, only coming this way. So you want the action up in the elevator shaft. And you want to finish with your fingers in the cookie jar. That will ensure the follow through. See, if you don't get good follow through, it'll be a brick, air ball, or a backboard clanger. But if you have nice follow through, if it is an air ball, at least you'll look pretty. <laughs> All right, so, so I let it go from 20. It was straight, it was true, I was two for two. I had four points and I said, bonus! Give me some more money. I'm doing good, you know? I went out, shot, we got the rebound, came down offense. I said, right side, 19 feet. I didn't, he I didn't hesitate. In your face. And I cranked it off from 19. And I said, rookie of the year. Get it all while you're here. They went down, shot, we got the rebound, came down offense. Somebody else shot, boys, man. I want that ball, give me the ball. So I, I go in, I'm standing next to the great Bill Russell. Certainly the greatest defensive center that's ever played basketball. Hi, Bill. Hi, Jay. How's it going? That's great. Ball hit the back of the rim. Russell goes like this with rebound. I mean, he rockets for the roof. He was so high, he turned and stared him right in the navel. But the ball hit the front of the rim, bounced up over his fingers, there's his fingers, there's the ball, both came down together, so I soared into the air. About that high. Snatched the ball with two hands, and you want to intimidate the defensive player, so you go like this, you go, ha, ha, yeah. Like that, see? Russell was terrified. He stood there coiled, poised waiting for me to jump so that he could tattoo Spalding right across my forehead. <laughs> he wants to brand me with the ball. So he's waiting for me to jump, but I already had jumped and he didn't know it. <laughs> I'm four for four. I got eight. And then all of a sudden it happened. To this day, I do not know who did it. Somebody sucked the last breath of oxygen out of the gym. <laughs> You can't drink that much Gatorade and run that hard and as the camera panned in tight on the rookie. 
I've just gone four for four in the garden. Real tight close-up, national TV. I threw up. And the highlight of my career was uh, <laughs> coughing my cookies in Boston Garden. <laughs> well, I found myself 29 years of age living in Corona Del Mar, Newport Beach area. We had the great house, watched the sunset behind Catalina Island every day, keys to the private beach, drove a new car, worked in Fashion Island. Those days, it's about a five minute trip, went home for lunch. You know, no smog, beach. Private beach, had it made. And uh, one little problem. My wife and I uh, were about to get a divorce. Now, I'd been in the Secret Service for 15 years. Uh, remember, I told you I came to Christ as a 14 year old. I'm now 29. 15 years have passed. And uh, nobody knew I was a Christian but me. Okay. You just couldn't tell. And I said, you know, before we do this, let's go back to church. It's been a long time, you know? So it was about the third week of church, and, and somebody asked us to go to a couples conference at a Christian camp up in the High Sierra. He said, 15 bucks for your deposit, and they'll make your wife happy, and we'll become friends. So surely a friendship's worth 15 bucks. What do you say? What am I going to say? <laughs> Your friendship's not worth 15 bucks. You know, you're not going to say that, so, so I go. That's one of those husband-wife deals. There's 60 couples, 120 people, and it's Saturday night, and I'm really wanting to leave, kind of like most of you. <laughs> and I'm waiting for the magic words, let's pray, because the magic words come, let's pray, it means 15, 20 seconds you can jet. And so the guy says, let's pray. And I'm thinking, wonderful. And five minutes go by and no sign of let up. And five minutes is an eternity when you're looking for 20 seconds worth. I start daydreaming, thinking of the ball game, mowing the grass, business problem. I tune in 10, 15 minutes later. They are still praying. There's a guy standing up over on the aisle right over there. And he's praying. And I know he's standing because I'm peeking during prayer. Because I think, what's it going to hurt? One guy going to peek and invalidate the whole thing? I didn't think so. <laughs> and he said, God, I haven't been a spiritual leader in my family. Would you forgive me? And he touches his wife and tears coming down her face. says, honey, would you help me become the kind of man God wants me to be? I was embarrassed for him. Saying something like that in front of all those people, not very macho. But somebody sniffed. And I'm thinking, let me out of here. You, you, you know what I mean? Then a woman stood up over in the middle there. I knew she was standing because I was peeking during prairie eye. She said, God, I've been so dominant in my household spiritually. Would you forgive me? She's crying. Her husband's crying. She said, honey, would you forgive me and help me become the kind of woman God wants me to be? And it was like a rash of hay fever turned loose in the place. Everybody started sniffing, you know? Blowing their noses. And I'm thinking, let me out of here. And my wife stood up. I could have killed her. I made my living in competition. I felt like I was just challenged to a pray off. I was mad. And then my heart went from here to here. Cuckoo. 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 And my palms got real sweaty. The guy leading the meeting said, you know, we can't close yet. There's somebody out there, his heart's beating right up in their throat. And he really said it. And your palms are probably real sweaty right now. And it is not me, no. <laughs> and he said, why don't you give up? Why don't you give up? Question, have you ever made a mistake in your life? Yes or no? God ever made a mistake? Why would you trust a known mistake maker, you, and not trust a God who's never made a mistake? 
And he said, why don't you thrust yourselves, yourself into the hands of a holy God? Let's see what happened. And I found myself crying. Not, not a little teary-eyed cry. This is one of those absolutely broken, embarrassingly convulsive kind of cries. One of those... <laughs> <laughs> and through that, somehow, I said, God, I don't fully understand everything that's going on right now. But I know you're God, and I'm not. And I've been trying to run things, and clearly it's about to go up in smoke. And I don't promise I'll never say no to you again. I just promise I won't want to. And if that's good enough, here I am. And I thrust myself into the hands of God. And I didn't know it, but I just prayed the last two verses, the 139th Psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. And uh, here I am. 20 years later. This is where we're going, folks. This is how we close. 20 seconds. If God speaks to you in these next three nights that we're together, would you agree with me tonight that if you hear God's voice, now if you just hear my voice or Bob's voice, I, I don't care. If it's somebody else's voice, I don't care what you do with it. But if it happens to be God's voice, however you hear God's voice, if you hear God's voice, will you promise to do it by our last night together? No, not promise. Would you agree to attempt to do it by then? Because it's not a vow. It's not a promise. It's the statement of the intent of your heart. And if by that last night it's too tough for you and you need to crawfish back out of the deal, you can still do that. But, but would you at least start our time together by saying, yeah, if God speaks to me, and I'm sure it's God, my intention is to do it. Now, if you can't raise your hand to that, you know, some folks come, come to church and they, they don't tend to get involved no matter what, you know, a hard heart. And if you're in the midst of sin, you already know what God's going to ask for, right? Right? And if you haven't decided to get out of it, then you're not going to raise your hand because you know that's what he's going to ask for. But for everybody else, you ought to be able to raise your hand. The cameras will not be on you during prayer. I won't violate the private time. Let's pray. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, clear a pathway for our prayer, and wherever that spiritual warfare is raged, loose the warring angels of God, perhaps in Michael's charge. And as Jehovah Nissi, the God who ensures victory, we remind the enemy that all things are subject to the feet of Jesus Christ. He has all power and all authority. And we'd ask for a hedge of thorns around this place to protect us from fiery darts from the enemy. May we be one-on-one -on -one with the brooding Holy Spirit of God, with no third-party interference from the enemy. I'm going to open my eyes, and uh, you keep your eyes closed. Uh, this is the deal. If you hear God's voice, however you hear it, between now and uh, the time we're through. Can you commit tonight to say yes uh, to that voice? Now, it's not a vow. It's not an oath. It's just the statement of the intent of your heart. And if it's too tough and you need to crawfish on it by the time we're over, then you've got the room to move on that. But will you... Say yes to God tonight with the intent to follow through with anything that he might ask of you. If that's a question that uh, you can raise your hand uh, yes to, would you raise your hand right now? Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Not a vow, not an oath, just a statement of the intent of your heart. Anybody else? If you couldn't flash your hand, 
you know, think through why. A hard heart is a really scary thing because God's going to break you. If you're in sin and you don't have any intent of giving it up, uh, God's going to break you. It's really painful. It's just better to give up now. Anybody else need to raise their hand? Okay. Father, thank you for what you're going to do in these next few nights, and we give you honor and praise. All God's people said, Amen.